Okay. All right. This panel addresses Russia, Europe, and the United States, um, and it, it focuses on the key implications of the crisis for international security and stability. Uh, these are obviously the, the decisions these actors take will have a, a major impact. Uh, your, how Europe and the U.S. respond or fail to respond will, of course, matter, as will the question is posed to Russia, and what are Russia's aims and what are their capabilities? Um, for the Euro Europe and the U.S., the key kind of issues we need to concern about is how do we best influence Russia's decisions? Uh, how do we reassure one another? And also, how do we reassure some of Russia's vulnerable neighbors, uh, which we'll hear more about later today, uh, in, in terms of their security and their interests as the crisis evolves? Uh, it's interesting that uh, some of these countries, such as been Ka Kazakhstan, has actually been asked by President Obama to make an effort to try and resolve the crisis, whereas others, such as Georgia, must be pondering the implications for their own security in occupied territories. And we've been here before. Uh, Ken mentioned the Czech crisis in, in 68. Uh, more recently, there's been Russian uh, involvement during the 1990s in manipulating some of the conflicts, uh, detaching part of Moldova, uh, encouraging the occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh and some surrounding Azerbaijani regions, and then the, the events in, in Georgia with uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And these, these territories still are detached. Uh, and so we need to consider uh, going forward how best to manage this crisis so that we perhaps do better than we've done in the past. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm very pleased to in introduce three of the speakers. I'll, I'll introduce them as they speak. The first uh, speaker is Andrew Cutchins. He is a senior fellow and director of the CSAS program on Russia and Europe. Um, an internationally known expert on Russian foreign and defense uh, domestic policies. Uh, does many interviews and co uh, commentary for business, government, media, and academia. Uh, his, before running the CSIS program from 2000 to 2006, he was at the Carnegie Endowment for International Pref Peace, uh, running its program in Washington on Russia and Eurasian affairs, and also director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, uh, where I've had the opportunity to speak on times, and it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a nice free island in the midst of uh, sometimes an oppressive uh, think tank community, so I think we all benefit from the contributions he's made at Carnegie as well as CSAS. Thank you, Andy. Please go ahead. And, and you're welcome to speak up here or from us. Oh, thank you, uh, Richard, for that kind invitation. I'll, I'll, I'll stay seated. If I stand up, that might only further <clears throat> enervate me more than I already am. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak here this morning. Delighted to be here with uh, you and and Julie and Richard, especially Julie, our colleagues together at the CSIS for a number, number, number of years. Um, I was planning on have to start apologizing for being late, uh, and I've been late a lot recently. I missed a train from New York yesterday. I missed a train to New York the day before. I had to miss my class last week being late, and I basically blame it on Mr. Putin. <laughs> the dude is just messing with my whole life. And I'm not really happy about it. And uh, as my friends from the South say, we're going to have to have a little talking to about this. And it's not going to be very diplomatic. Um, but seriously, I want to share with you to start out with uh, an email that I wrote very late Monday night. It was actually early Tuesday morning because I uh, actually wrote it to my boss, John Hamry at CSIS. It kind of captures where I was with this crisis. I'll just read you this, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about what I think is going on with uh, our dear friend Vladimir and how he's thinking about this and, and what he might do. Um, I'll be very frank with you. Uh, well, I usually don't pull any punches anyway. But I'm very, very worried, deeply, deeply, deeply concerned. Uh, to me, I feel like we're in the the most dangerous place uh, right now for European security, probably uh, uh, since the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and maybe even a little bit, little bit before that. So this is what I wrote. My brain and my bones tell me that the Ukraine-Crimea-Russia standoff is going to end very, very badly. The best case scenario seems now just for Ukraine and Russia to avoid war. While there was plenty of blame for the EU, Russia, and Ukraine leading up to Yanukovych's about face in November, 
With his Crimea escapade, Putin went off the reservation, so to speak, and to mix metaphors for the past 10 days seems to be doubling down on disaster at every instance. With the imminent referendum in, on Crimea on the 16th, a point which walking anything back, or to use Obama's terminology of Putin using an off-ramp, is impossible. At some point, one, this is the five theses, I guess, at some point it seems inevitable that there will be violence in Crimea. There are simply too many people living on that peninsula who object to unification with Russia. Two, the Ukrainian government cannot take such a result lying down. There are, they are virtually on a war footing now. How they have been able to restrain themselves to the point has required more than the patience of Job. Putin, I believe, is under the false impression that eastern and southern areas of Ukraine really do want to join Russia. I think he may believe his own propaganda, and the Russian media is doing everything it can to whip up a war frenzy. The Russian narrative on Ukraine has lost touch with reality and or created an alternative reality that bears little resemblance to facts on the ground. Four, Moscow's narrative is completely at odds with that of Europe and our own. Real diplomacy is virtually impossible when perspectives are at such odds with each other. Whatever happens, as long as Putin is around, our approach to Russia, and I mean the United States and Europe, will never be the same. Um, there is nothing that has happened in the past uh, three days for me to alter uh, that perspective, uh, unfortunately. Um, I wish Mr. Kerry all the luck in the world in uh, talking with the uh, his counterpart, Mr. Lavrov, uh, tomorrow, but I think uh, uh, I don't. I'm not optimistic. I'm not op optimistic about it. the The most worrisome thing for me about about this is that it has led me to to question uh, some fundamental uh, assumptions I have had, kind of my operational code, so to speak to go back to old Sovietological terminology that I cut my teeth on. Um, the operational code of Vladimir Putin. And I've always looked at Putin as essentially a cold, brutally cold, calculating, realist, pragmatist, whatever you want to, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. And he is, he carefully assesses the cost benefit of, of his moves. In this move, starting with the military occupation of Crimea, I think he's made a serious miscalculation. I would love to be wrong. At this point, the best case scenario, I think, is essentially a referendum goes through on Sunday. Uh, I don't think there's a big mystery about how that referendum will, will go. As Stalin used to say, it's not who votes, but who counts the votes. Uh, and there will be a vote for unification with Russia. If there is no violence, then that is very good. Uh, if Russia will then have on its hands, it would seem, not a, not such a digestible uh, tidbit, so to speak, in Crimea. There are lots of actually quite pragmatic on the ground challenges it would face, like the fact that how do you get drinking water to Crimea? Uh, it's virtually entirely dependent upon uh, Ukraine for that, the rest of Ukraine, for that. Excuse me. Don't misunderstand me or try to, let's not, I don't want to pick, go get deep into semantics. Um, energy, uh, elect electricity, etc. You know, at some point, even in this scenario, the, the Russians and or the Crimean government, quote unquote, is going to have to negotiate. You can't have a, an airlift 
for drinking water for two million people. But more, more importantly, uh, and of course, the, this best case scenario involves that there is no further Russian military engagement uh, intervention uh, elsewhere in Ukraine, because that is the disaster scenario. Uh, that does mean war, um, in my view. All right. So what, what was Mr. Putin thinking when he, when he did this? Clearly, there was a plan on the shelf for this, you know, stealthy kind of uh, intervention into Crimea, uh, which was tactically uh, quite clever and effective. Uh, <clears throat> but what I think it gets to the fundamental question is what does Mr. Putin want, frankly, with in Ukraine? Well. Uh, he wants certainly a government in Kiev, which is not overtly anti anti Russian. Uh, he certainly doesn't want a government which would uh, renege on the uh, long term uh, agreement for the stationing of the Black Sea Fleet in Sebastopol. Uh, he would want, I think, a uh, a different federal structure. <coughs> For Ukraine, which would provide considerably more autonomy, he would for not just Crimea, but for eastern and southern portions of Ukraine. Uh, and he would not want what happens in Ukraine, I think, to obstruct uh, his ambitions for his post-Soviet reintegration project. Um, and he probably wouldn't want to have what's, what happens in Ukraine to have a very significant and dramatic impact on the Russian economy. The Russian economy is already in a vulnerable position, experiencing a growth rate of uh, between 0 and 1%, despite the fact that the oil price remains still over $100 a barrel. He's done a quite a remarkable thing, or a remarkable thing has happened since he's become, or since de facto and de jure power have reunited, shall we say, in Russia in 2012. Uh, this, there's been a very strong correlation between the oil price and growth or lack of growth in the Russian economy going back to the first oil crisis in 1973. More than 40 oh. years, uh, that correlation has actually been broken. I mean, we have a deeply stagnated Russian economy uh, and in a, with, a, with a high oil price, oil price environment. Leave that, leave that aside. The, so, um, with where we are with the military occupation of Crimea uh, and the imminent referendum coming up on Sunday, uh, what, does it, what does the score sheet look like, most likely, for what I think are Mr. Putin's goals? See, because the great irony, as of where I'm going to conclude, is I think that probably Mr. Putin w would have achieved those goals uh, without a military occupation. Is, I think, what has happened already uh, has gone a long way to promote national identity throughout Ukraine. Mr. Putin may be regarded historically as the godfather of Ukrainian national integration um, that's a lot it's a ways it's a ways down the road obviously but I mean I don't see have not seen you know thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people in the east and the south that were clamoring for joining the Russian Federation or are doing so more so now clearly they're watching things very very carefully and trying to figure out uh, the best course of action. But, I mean, no Ukrainian government uh, at this point is, is going to be able to regard Russia in the same way uh, that it did before Mr. Yanukovych fled and before the, uh, the military occupation of, of Crimea. Two, on the post-Soviet integration project, First of all, we all know that everybody uh, 
in the, for lack of a better term, in the post-Soviet space is extremely nervous, would be a euphemism, I think, uh, to describe uh, their views on things right now. Many of the states are in very, very uh, awkward positions and uh, let me just suffice to say, I think that uh, what he has done is going to um, not facilitate uh, a more rapid reintegration of the post-Soviet space. I'll leave it at that. We can have questions and discussions about discussion about it uh, after, because I see the clock is is ticking. Finally, um, the economy. Uh, well, let me just say that this was a decision that was taken uh, that in total, in disregard for the economic ramifications therefrom. Um, already, uh, when I wrote that email on Monday, the ruble was trading at an all-time low, all-time low, uh, at more than 36 to the dollar. That was more than 10 percent lower than what it was at the nadir of the global financial crisis uh, in January of 2009. And uh, certainly some bad things expected in the future have been, has been factored into that, but uh, it seems that we're on a path of sort of inevitable spiraling, uh, further spiraling of the um, of the relation downward downward spiraling of the relationship between the United States and Russia and Europe and in Russia, but uh, I won't say any more any more about that. Um, so what what does Mr. Putin want? Um, I've had the I've been re-examining that 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 question uh, again. I kind of go to the cost the cost benefit analysis, but. Let's remember what Mr. Putin told Mr. Bush in Bucharest in April of 2008, essentially that Ukraine is not a real country. Not a real country. Um, I think that uh, if Mr. Putin had greater capacity, uh, I, he would pursue this reintegration much more assertively and aggressively than he, is, than he even has. Uh, but I think he has been fairly, fairly astute in measuring how much capacity he has. My fear here, though, is is that uh, uh, he may have lost a bit of his sense of the balance in this. So let me just stop there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for your very insightful comments. Our next speaker is Julian Smith. She is a senior fellow and director of the Strategy and Statecraft Program uh, at the Center for New American Security uh, right across the street. She's also a senior vice president at Beacon Global Strategies, LLC. Uh, her most recent position in government was a, a very prominent one. She was deputy national security advisor to the U.S. vice president from April 2012 to June 2013. Before that, she served as Principal Director for European and NATO Policy in the Office of Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon, uh, which included NATO and European policy. And uh, that involved uh, she, her dealing with 31 different countries, and, and, and she was also awarded the Office of Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service. So uh, please welcome me. Uh, please join me in welcoming me, Ms. Smith, and looking forward to hearing your comments. Thanks. Thanks, Richard, for the invitation, and thanks to all of you for coming out on a chilly uh, morning to uh, have a discussion uh, on the crisis in Ukraine. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes and talk about the transatlantic angle, uh, transatlantic cooperation specifically, uh, kind of how this has unfolded um, over the last couple of weeks. And I wanted to issue a bit of a report card on a couple of different fronts. One, I wanted to say something about what transatlantic cooperation looked like before the crisis hit uh, in this corner of the world. And then more importantly, I wanted to take a look at how Europe and the United States have tried to do three things. One, push back on Russian aggression and get the Russians out of Crimea. Two, what kind of job they're doing and working with the new Ukrainian government. 
and three, how they're faring in reassuring our partners and allies in Central and Eastern Europe who, as Andy noted, are very concerned and quite skittish about what they've been watching uh, in their neighborhood and worried about the implications for their own uh, security. So uh, just up front, um, before the crisis hit, I think Europe and the United States deserve pretty low marks, close to a fail, on how they've been managing this corner of the world. I think they've been fairly confident in uh, their ability to sit back and let events unfold in front of them. They haven't been particularly active. The EU obviously has been more active than the United States. But in many ways, I think the approach of both Europe and the United States was to look at this corner of the world and say, all right, there are some rough spots, there are some difficult transitions, but by and large, the major work that we put forward together in those first few years after the end of the Cold War is now coming to a close. And we are consumed with events in the Middle East, we're consumed with issues like Syria and Egypt and Yemen and Iraq and Afghanistan, and the list goes on and on. And therefore, we won't be able to dedicate as much time and as many resources to this corner of the world. And the end result of that lack of focus is now unfolding right before our eyes in terms of a fairly sloppy response, both by the Europeans and the Americans, in trying to grapple with this. So that brings me to my first grading area, and that is the first mark I want to issue, and that is how have Europe and the United States done in pushing back uh, on Russian aggression? So in the first few hours and days after we saw the Russians go into Crimea, I thought the, the response looked um, particularly sloppy. I would give it a D, if not failing. Um, Europe and the United States were not lashed up at all. We saw the White House come out uh, immediately on that Friday and lean into the President's speech about costs. We saw Europe stand back and then call an emergency session of the EU that would then be held three days later on a Monday. Apparently, they were unable to hold an emergency session on a crisis of this scale on a weekend, uh, which is a little bit surprising. And I talked to a lot of folks in the White House, and folks were obviously scrambling to get European counterparts uh, on the line. But what you saw immediately was kind of the worst case scenario, and that was a very public transatlantic debate about the differences that we had and how we were going to approach the crisis. So immediately you had countries like Germany and the UK and the Netherlands come out and say, hey, we just want to state up front. Shanks sanctions might be a bridge too far. We have some hesitation on that. We really want to go for engagement and dialogue. And Merkel was proposing at that time the contact group. And the United States was leaning in pretty heavily to the sanctions idea. And so the worst case scenario is to have this debate publicly because, as we all know, Putin always likes to seize on any opportunity to drive a wedge between the transatlantic partners. And so those first few days felt deeply uncomfortable. It looked like there was no communication going on, that we didn't have a plan, that Europe and the United States were, in fact, going to be on opposite pages on this. And then over time, I think the marks, I would grade them slightly higher, were more lashed up. We've tucked some of the debates behind closed doors, private discussions. Last week, Dan Fried flew over and had a very good session with European counterparts on sketching out exactly what targeted sanctions could look like, starting to list the individuals that they would go after. They started looking at visa bans. They looked at asset freezes. They started sharing information. This should have happened sooner, but at least we're getting our act together a little bit on the economic front to try and coordinate what we want to do together. We also saw, um, finally, Europe and the United States come together in calling off the G8 preparatory meetings. Uh, this isn't a big stick. Obviously, Putin may brush this off. But long term, what I'd like to see it lead to is a complete elimination of the G8 in practice as a forum, which I think would send a pretty strong signal. And I'd very much like to see a G7 meeting put on the calendar uh, in the next couple of months. I know that would be challenging to do within this calendar year, but I think it would be an important uh, symbol. Then we had Europe and the United States take a couple of unilateral steps. We've had the US call off all mill-to-mill -mill engagement with the Russians. Uh, which was important. There's very little that Putin cares about. Uh, he cares about the economy and the trade relationship to a certain extent. 
and he, he does care, at least his military advisors seem to indicate that they do care about the mill-to-mill -mill engagement with the United States, and so we shut the door uh, on that. We're looking now also at OECD membership. That's something the Russians have been pretty aggressively uh, pursuing, and so we've turned the spigot off on that front. So at this point, there's more to be done, but in terms of how it would grade coordination, we're getting better. It was sloppy, like I said, and, and difficult. Uh, up front, but at least now the channels of communication are open. We now appear to be a little bit more on the same page. The Germans in particular have been able to lean into their relationship. Merkel's relationship with Putin has been very important, and she's been very helpful in relaying messages back uh, to the White House and serving as a bit of an interlocutor and is a little bit less off the ranch in terms of uh, where she wants to go uh, with sanctions. Second category, supporting the new Ukrainian government. I think we've done a slightly better job from a transatlantic perspective. We had the Kerry visit followed immediately by the Lady Ashton visit. Those visits, obviously, largely symbolic but important. And then followed up by pledges of $15 billion in assistance uh, by the European Union, $1 billion in assistance by the United States. There are complications in delivering on those pledges, and of course the Ukrainians need far more than that. They're estimating they need somewhere in the mid-30s, possibly $35, $37 million uh, of assistance, uh, billion, sorry. But, um, but anyways, the wheels are turning, and I feel like we've tried to make um, some progress there. We are both sending technical advisors. Uh, we're going to turn the lights on on a Ukrainian business council meeting. Carlos Pasquale will be flying over to have a conversation about energy. Uh, there are all sorts of things that they're trying to do at the State Department to enhance the government to government contacts. Of course, having the PM here yesterday was important uh, as well. So on that front, uh, I think it'll be constant, and the challenge for the transatlantic partners will be not to make the mistake they made last time, and that is to um, lose sight of what the long-term goals are for Ukraine and not, not support it uh, in the medium and long term. It can't just be in the next couple of weeks and months. This is a long-term endeavor. We're going to need a grand strategy and kind of a joint approach on supporting uh, this new team, and there are plenty of challenges. Lastly, on the reassurance piece, the United States, I would give slightly higher marks than the Europeans, the U.S., in some ways Central and Eastern Europe's looking for more reassurance from their U.S. partners. We've seen the U.S. commit uh, additional F-15s to the Baltic air policing mission, and the U.S. is also enhancing training in Poland. Uh, I think uh, from my conversations with folks over at the Pentagon, they're looking at an array of other reassurance initiatives that could be launched in the coming weeks and months. Europe's having a little bit harder time trying to understand how they're going to play in this space. There's difference of opinions. Italy looks at it differently than Norway, than Spain, than Germany. Everybody's trying to figure out how they're going to reassure uh, our friends in Central and Eastern Europe. I think the biggest step that they could do is to come together at the NATO summit in September and offer something very concrete on the partnerships front. Personally, I'd love to see MAP offered for Georgia at that juncture. I think it's highly unlikely. I think there's a lot of resistance to that idea across the NATO alliance, uh, particularly in Western Europe. Uh, and so I'm not entirely sure that's within the realm of the possible. But if it's not, I'd like to see NATO having conversations now about what types of partnership initiatives it can put forward at the September summit uh, to send a signal to countries like Georgia, like Moldova, like Bosnia, all of the countries also that are currently members that are feeling uncertain and insecure in, in this new security environment. And so we'll have to see what, what we can do uh, on that front together uh, as partners. Um, lastly, I would say um, the bottom line is that it's very important that we start to look at a kind of overarching grand strategy. Right now we're kind of playing with tactics, little maneuvers here and there, but it would be nice for us to come together and have a high-level meeting. We could use the upcoming EU-US summit. The president will be in Europe in, in just a few days. He'll be traveling to The Hague, Brussels, and Rome. I think n failing to use that EU-US summit as an opportunity to put out some messaging but also to generate some fresh ideas on the overarching strategy would be a mistake, and I, I hope they seize on that opportunity. Fortunately, a lot of EU-US summits tend to be fairly prescripted. 
uh, they know what they're going to say in advance, they deliver, you know, a couple minutes of remarks and everyone heads back home. I hope that's not the case. Again, they, they really should seize on the opportunity of having Europe settle down with the president in this kind of forum to have a more long-term um, conversation. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Um, all in all, again, plenty of more work to be done and a really rough start in part because of the blind eye that we had on this corner of the world for so long. Um, but I'm hoping that things will improve as we have greater and greater coordination along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Those are some of the most actionable recommendations I've seen in a long time dealing with this issue. So that was really, really helpful. Um, the, our last speaker is Richard Fontaine. He actually is the president of the Center for New American Security, again, right across the street, um, and a uh, longtime expert on many of these issues. He served as senior advisor and a senior fellow at CNAS before his, uh, his appointment as president in 2012. Uh, before 2009, for five years, he was the foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain, uh, working on the, uh, these and other issues. Uh, he's also worked at the State Department, National Security Council, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and I believe you were at the Munich Security Council at the conference, the most recent one, so you probably have a good sense of what, what, how people are feeling about the U.S. foreign policy in, in general towards Europe. So please go ahead. Well, thanks, Richard, and thanks to uh, Hudson and Ken and uh, and to the uh, M Hungarian ambassador and, and everybody who made uh, this session uh, possible. It couldn't have been timelier. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk for uh, a couple of minutes about U.S. policy responses to the crisis in Ukraine. And the first um, thing I would note is, um, as some people have, uh, I think, rightly pointed out, um, this issue uh, in Russia crossing the border into uh, Crimea has also sort of crossed a Rubicon in terms of the U.S. relationship with Russia, uh, the relationship between the transatlantic partners, and where um, and, and how the United States and its partners in Europe uh, need to respond. This is an issue, I think, that is bigger uh, than just Crimea. It's bigger than Ukraine. And in fact, it's bigger uh, than just Europe in some ways. Uh, the vision for uh, that has been put forth uh, under successive presidents uh, for Europe as a continent that's whole free and at peace. Um, the threat uh, now is uh, of a, a, a vision by uh, Mr. Putin of a continent or at least a Russian near abroad that is uh, divided, unfree, and at perpetual risk. So this is a profoundly challenging to uh, what we've been trying to accomplish for a long time. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, the strength of norms that bar the use of force to seize territory uh, is something uh, that has been an extremely important uh, stabilizing factor in international relations uh, since uh, 1945. And uh, we are seeing uh, this um, potentially being uh, upended. And so I think that, uh, you know, the United States and uh, its partners in Europe need to uh, think very carefully about uh, what their response is going to be, um, first over the short run uh, and then over the longer term uh, when it comes to uh, what uh, Russia has, uh, how Russia has conducted itself. Um, there's been some uh, written recently about, um, about uh, Russia um, sort of having lost no matter what the United States and Europe do. Uh, there was, I saw a couple of pieces saying, you know, Putin's already lost the war, so to speak. And I think that this, my, my reading is, is different than this. Um, I think that the response of the United States and Europe is going to be profoundly important uh, to whether uh, Russia is able to uh, consolidate its, its gains, essentially, uh, in Crimea um, over the long run or not. Um, I mean, I recall uh, in 2008 um, the Russian invasion of Georgia uh, there was a lot of talk at the time about imposing costs on Russia for uh, for its intervention in Georgia. Um, there was essentially two uh, sort of diplomatic sanctions that were put into place at the time, suspension of the NATO-Russia Council and the U.S. suspended talks on the civilian nuclear agreement. Um, well, that the, on the case of the NATO-Russia Council, that lasted months, not years, and it was uh, revived. And then in 2010, the United States revived uh, talks on the civil nuclear uh, agreement. Uh, what was left is uh, Russia having detached South Ossetia and Abkhazia from Georgia, uh, recognizing this kind of weird independence uh, status, but clearly an allegiance to Moscow. And um, uh, the, um, the 
Russian government being uh, in violation of the terms that it agreed to under the ceasefire. So essentially what my reading of this is that uh, the West essentially accommodated itself uh, to Russia's willingness to establish facts on the ground uh, through the use of force in Georgia. Now, will Ukraine be different? It may be very different, uh, but it may be it will be different insofar as uh, the United States and Europe respond differently to the intervention in Ukraine than they did to the intervention in, in Georgia. Um, in terms of the actual policy responses, I think the first um, objective is to figure out what the objectives are of the United States and Europe and hopefully try to align those to be as close as possible. Uh, in the immediate it, uh, term, it is to, I, I would suggest that it's to forestall a Russian advance into eastern Ukraine. Uh, avoid the outbreak of violence between Russian forces and Ukrainian military or partisans. I think if the Russians do go into eastern Ukraine, uh, I think they'll find a very different reception than they find than they found thus far in Crimea. Um, they may uh, discover that being greeted as liberators uh, is not as easy a task as uh, some uh, some think. Uh, I also agree that in Crimea, over the long run, the, it, you will have a potential tinderbox kind of um, uh, situation. Uh, there, given the mix of the population there. Um, so they had this kind of immediate um, uh, immediate uh, objectives then to, over the longer run, to demonstrate opposition to the forcible changing of borders uh, in Europe. I think there's sort of three elements of, uh, of policy response that um, some of which the administration has, has begun to put into place and some which uh, still remains a work in progress. I think the first is to resist Russian domination of Crimea and expansion of its military presence in eastern Ukraine. The second is to reinforce the Kiev government through economic aid and diplomatic support. And the third is to reassure our NATO allies who are watching these events with alarm. Um, in the readouts of the conversations that, the, uh, that Mr. Putin had with uh, President Obama and, and uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel and others um, that the, the, the Kremlin issued, they, it was, it was a, a, a rather dangerous concept that, um, a rather dangerous doctrine that Mr. Putin has articulated, which is this right of Russia to intervene militarily to protect not just Russians, but Russian speaking um, populations outside its borders. Um, I mean, there are literally tens of millions of Russian speakers living abroad. And so, um, to the extent that this is going to manifest itself as um, as Russian policy, then it threatens to radiate tension and instability in, in numerous countries. So I think the first uh, task is to um, orient American policy around non-recognition of Moscow's attempts to establish uh, facts on the ground in opposition to further expansion of the Russian military presence. Um, this means putting into place uh, some of the diplomatic and economic sanctions that have been kind of bandied about. I mean, the, the G7 uh, statement that came out uh, yesterday and suspension of the preparatory meeting uh, for the G8 summit um, should be, I think, just the beginning of that. I agree with with Julie. I think it's time for the G7 to reconstitute itself without Russia and um, and uh, drop the idea of the of the summit in Sochi. Uh, beyond that, I would suggest that the U.S. Congress, uh, as the Senate Foreign Relations Committee yesterday began looking at uh, the possible expansion of the application of the Magnitsky Act sanctions uh, to Russian individuals responsible for the aggression in Ukraine and uh, other financial and, and diplomatic penalties. Um, as has been pointed out uh, um, by Julian and others, uh, you know, the bolstering through economic aid, uh, through IMF channels and bilaterally, uh, the, the government in Kiev uh, will be an important part of this. Uh, that, I think, needs to be um, coupled with a strong message that the new government is needs to be inclusive of both its Ukrainian and Russian-speaking uh, populations. And um, then in terms of the reassurance piece of this, uh, there needs to be uh, a real uh, robust series of consultations about precisely what kinds of, uh, of moves would, um, would send a, a message to our partners, our NATO partners in the East, uh, whether it's uh, uh, increased deployments or, or training exercises and so forth, um, to dem demonstrate the credibility uh, of the alliance. I mean, uh, the one way, though, to, to think about all this is to try to take a to think a couple of moves ahead. And um, you know, if you're trying to square policy and think of punitive actions toward Russia and resisting its uh, attempts to 
uh, consolidate its gains or do more, we have to think about what the likely Russian response is going to be to these things. And so that's going to involve contingency planning, for example, uh, to deal with Russia potentially shutting down the northern distribution network where we're getting some of our material out of Afghanistan. Uh, General Dunford, uh, the commanding officer in Afghanistan, testified yesterday that, or said yesterday that uh, he didn't expect that to, um, to, to prove um, uh, you know, particularly onerous. However, it could, it could prove costly uh, to us. Um, the, we have to think about the reactions of, of businesses in the United States and uh, in uh, Europe that will, you know, no doubt uh, be averse to uh, seeing sanctions go into place um, against Russia uh, should we seek that path. And um, also on the energy front, um, the uh, contingency planning for uh, Russia using the energy, the gas supplies uh, as, a, as a lever. So part of the exercise on the policy front is to think about not just uh, what we can do uh, in the immediate term and even over the long term, but how we will respond to the inevitable Russian response to our actions. Um, so that, I'll leave it there and uh, maybe we can get into a discussion. Thank you so much, Richard. And uh, that's very important to uh, agree to look at the Russia response. I think Andy said you wanted to make a comment in there about so Russia, and then I'll let you, you guys contribute. If you want, then we'll go to the audience for questions and answers. So start thinking about anything you might want to ask, please. <coughs> Thanks, Richard. Actually, my, what I wanted to, to, to point out was something, something different that I ne neglected to say in my opening remarks because I was basically still in the angry at Putin mode. <laughs> um, now, the angry at Putin mode, is, it's, it's, it's still there. But um, I think there's something really uh, there's a there's a there's a core importance to something that we haven't we've neglected to say, and that is really you know what happened what happens on the ground in in Ukraine, because uh, you know it's not what uh, the Europeans do it's not what the United States does and it's not even uh, so much what 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 Russia what Russia does, but let me just back backtrack about this because. It gets at to the kind of the, the core, I think, of, you know, sort of misunderstanding between uh, the Russians and certainly the Americans, uh, the Europeans uh, as well, maybe to somewhat of a of a of a lesser extent. Um, you know, okay, why did Putin do this? Okay, one, he was very pissed off, post imperial stress syndrome, which has been you know <laughs> fermenting for 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 a for a while. But I mean, what I'm, to be serious about it, uh, essentially his Ukraine policy over the last 10 years, which he had invested, even more than 10 years, which he invested a tremendous amount in, had failed with the collapse of the February 21 agreement, which of course the Russians, the Russians did, not, did not sign because they didn't see it as legitimate that the legitimately elected leader, Mr. Yanukovych, should have to leave power soon. Um, but of course, once it's once it's uh, collapsed, then then there was the the call to well, let's go back to the status the status quo ante of the February 21st agreement, which the Americans signed on to, the Europeans signed on to, right. and we were happy to do so. Were we the ones responsible for the fact that that February that agreement did not hold? Of course not. There are the forces on the ground. The forces on the ground caused that agreement not to be. Not, not to hold, not to hold up, um, and <laughs> frankly, you know, I think the the U.S. government would have been very pleased if that agreement had had held up because we wouldn't be in the hornet's nest that we are that we are right now. But when I personally read that agreement on February 21, that included that included the stipulation that Mr. Yanukovych was going to stay in power for 10 more months as the president of Ukraine, I just said, "There's no way, no way that this is going to this is going to stick." And uh, uh, the, the opposition, which obviously includes disparate forces uh, in Ukraine, is going to uh, not agree with this at all. And that happened very quickly, and we saw, we saw what took place. And, you know, if we go back to the Orange Revolution, in fact, uh, you know, the Russian interpretation, and this, is, this has been very, very consistent, from the, the color revolutions to the Arab Spring, basically any... Uh, social political uprising in a state in which the Russians and Europeans and Americans uh, con contend over, the Russians will, will emphasize much more the influence of external forces than the indigenous forces on the ground. That is consistent. Uh, and it, 
in my my view, absolutely fundam the fundamental factor are those indigenous social, economic, political forces on the ground in the states over which the Russian Federation, over which the European Union, over which the Americans, we don't, we are not able to, to, to control. Okay? So that's, that's what happened. And, you know, Mr. Putin, as usual, is going to kind of overread external forces. Or, you know, maybe he's just doing this completely cynic cynically to justify something that he's wanted to do all, all this time. I don't know. But, you know, that is, a, that is very, very important, which brings me back to the, the concerns about, you know, where we are right now, okay? You know, we don't know what the reaction is going to be on the ground on Sunday and afterwards to this referendum. We don't know what the reaction is going to be to any further uh, kind of pressure in eastern, southern Ukraine, or on the, uh, or in in uh, in Kiev and uh, or in, in west western western Ukraine. So there are a lot of uncontrolled actors by the key external actors that we're talking about that are really going to, at the end of the day, determine what what happens. And I'm not obviously what the United States does and what the Russian Federation does and the and the EU and, and uh, the European states uh, ind individually individually do is important, but it's it's the on the ground that uh, that is going to uh, you know be the most funda fundamental fundamental factor, and it's uh, it's again why I get back to my first point. I have just been kind of amazed that so far here we are. Uh, it was two weeks ago, February twenty seventh, that these military forces arrived, took over the parliament in uh, Simferopol. That was one thing that really pissed me off about the first re response uh, on our part. It was already clear that the, over, the, the takeover of the, of the Crimean parliament had been done. And really, we didn't think we knew who did that, and <laughs> I'll leave that at that. But I wanted to point out that the, uh, uh, it's this, this uncontrolled forces and Again, you know, people have plans, we have responses, but there are unintended consequences and there are uncontrollable factors. And so often in history, it's those things that actually uh, make or break the, the, uh, the result. Can I just add one, one comment to that? I mean, I think that's an important point. And if you look at, I was in um, Kiev on the January after the Orange Revolution. I had been with a congressional delegation in Crimea the previous summer and, um, you know, there was a lot of, if you recall the Orange Revolution happening, um, th there was, you know, an immediate kind of American response that we were not going to stand for st stolen elections, first run of this thing. We were on the ground speaking with the, uh, the U.S. Embassy uh, there, and, um, and they said, uh, you know, we basically, at the highest levels, you know, made absolutely clear to the Ukrainian government, we will not, you know, the United States does not accept this outcome. And you know things changed, and embassy thought, "Wow, did this?" You know, they they listened to us, and then they kind of realized, "Well, actually, it, it was just the stuff on the ground that was was producing this." Right. I mean, that's not to say that. I mean, as I said in my remarks, I mean the the, the long term response it goes well beyond uh, Ukraine, I think, and that's why it's very important. Um, but you can't discount uh, the reaction of of people on the ground and how that's going to affect the domestic politics and the response there, not just the external stuff. I mean, the, the, to follow, the Yushchenko people were surprised mm -hmm. yeah. that so many people stayed out for, for so long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to say that? Okay. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone and then give your identification and just remind everybody that this is being recorded, the session. Again, Natalia Lakiza, US Ukraine Foundation. I have an answered question from the previous session, but I will change it a bit, and I would like the pa panel to answer it if you uh, would like. Um, yes, um, uh, international community uh, shown unprecedented support to Ukraine. It did not happen in this century to any independent country, yes, diplomatic, political, economic in the future, nearest future, yes. But also there is a military um, activity inside Ukraine, outside of Ukraine, military trainings, um, bringing forces to Poland and trainings in Black Sea, also concentration of Russian army around uh, Ukraine and inside of Crimea and uh, 
in some parts of Kherson Oblast even. So um, March 16, a referendum and predictable results that um, population of Crimea will vote to reunite, with, to reunite with Russia. What will be the next step for international community? Will it, be continue, will it continue its uh, diplomatic, political actions, or it will be a military activity on this matter? Thank you. Is it addressed to anybody in particular? Or no, no, to the panel. Um, are you going to collect some questions? Do you want no, to just do one, one. one? So I, 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 I don't see uh, a, a lot of um, enthusiasm on either side of the Atlantic or a lot of creative thinking on using the military instrument. In fact, most of the leaders on both sides have indicated that they don't. And in fact, we've heard this. John McCain has said this. I mean, we've heard this from the Hill as well. So. Um, certainly from a bipartisan perspective on this side of the Atlantic, um, I don't see uh, a lot of support for turning to the military instrument. Um, that said, I know that the DASD, um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for uh, this corner of the world, Evelyn Farkas, is going to, um, as soon as she possibly can, she's committed to enhancing defense consultations with her counterparts in Ukraine and they're working to find dates for that right away. I mean, to Andy's point about this unbelievable restraint that we've seen on the part of the Ukrainian military, which is it just, I mean, makes my jaw hang open. Uh, it, it, it's almost unimaginable. Um, I think part of the reason why we've seen that take place is there has been a remarkable level of cooperation between the West and Ukrainian forces for quite some time. And that, we can't underestimate the importance of that. I don't want the West to credit themselves with anything in this case. What I'm saying is we should value long-term engagement with these types of military forces. We do it with Georgia as well. And in cases of when you're facing a crisis, it's absolutely critical that they stay on the right side and they show this kind of restraint. Now, that may not hold. We'll see how events unfold and if we again see violence erupt somewhere in the country. Um, but even if that were to be the case, again, I, I don't see NATO responding. Um, I see NATO continuing to provide reassurance through military means. Uh, and enhancing training and increasing its presence. We've got AWACS flying over Poland and Romania right now. Um, so more thinking and more initiative on that front, but in terms of actual NATO forces, U.S. forces, European forces showing up in Ukraine, I think that's unrealistic. Can I say something? Yes, please. Um. I, uh, first of all, I, I, I agree with uh, what, what Julie said, and also agree with, I mean, with, with everything that my colleagues colleagues have said, but in particular uh, to the grading of our response, um, because initially there was, it was, we had turned Harry, Tr uh, excuse me, Teddy Roosevelt upside down. Yeah. We were talking loudly and carrying no stick. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now we've, we've kind of, we're, we, we've been matching uh, our, our words and our and our and our rhetoric, our words and our deeds. Um, the, I mean, what's going to happen after the after the referendum, is that the the pressure to go, you know, to pull the trigger on much tougher sanctions. Uh, it's going to be there, and it's and it's going to happen. I mean, it would have been almost almost unimaginable. I. I think, for the EU in particular, obviously because they have a much deeper economic, trade, and investment relationship with the Russian Federation, and it's very kind of, you know, it's weighted differently in each in each country. But for to come to to come to a consensus, it has to be a consensus. Everybody has to sign on. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see. Uh, I, I certainly hope, but I think we are going to see a uh, tougher set of sanctions from than we than we. Uh, would have would have expected uh, the effect probably won't be immediately of course on the uh, on the, the Russian economy but it will be but it will be longer longer term on the on the military ish, issue um, yeah it's it, it is uh, accurate that uh, um, I think that it's unrealistic to expect you know that uh, you know suddenly on March 17th NATO is going to have a meeting and 
and uh, give Article 5 uh, uh, security guarantees to, to Ukraine. But um, I think it's I mean, one of the things that was a real concern for me in the, if we go back to February, 20, February 28th and, the, and our initial response, um, is that uh, there, it seemed that not only President Obama, but I mean, everybody who was strongly criticizing President Obama you know, would, would start the remarks by, you know, the military option is off the table. And it's like, you know, <laughs> it's sort of elementary deterrence theory. <laughs> Why don't we say less, perhaps? Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, because I, I'm, you know, Mr. Putin, I think, is a very hard-boiled guy, and he needs, <laughs> and he needs to be stared down. Um, but, I mean, there are other things that you can do besides, uh, you know, make an Article 5 uh, commitment. And I was very pleased to see later, because I was like, where the hell are those two ships that were supposedly in eastern, the eastern part of the Black Sea that were there in the event that there was a terrorist attack in Sochi or something went, went bad there? Well, I was embarrassed to find out that, well, one of them actually had run aground trying to go to port in Turkey, and the commander was sacked. Uh, but, okay, well, but never, nevertheless, you know, why don't we send some ships into the Black Sea just to actually, uh, to convey, convey the, convey the message? Because, you know, why don't we, you know, see that there are higher alert levels on the uh, neighboring NATO member countries of, uh, of Ukraine? You know, why aren't we seeing initially talk about, uh, more, uh, uh, planes and overflights to the to the Baltic Straits, which are the most, of course, obviously nervous about what's 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 happened, and particularly given this uh, the new doctrine of uh, protect, protection of not just uh, ethnic Russians or even Russian speakers, but uh, as uh, kind of compatriots. Um, we have them here too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> in fact, there's a huge diaspora community you know, of them here in the here in the United States. Uh, more than more than more than more than more than two million. Um, so, but but we've we've mobilized we've mobilized that uh, 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 relatively quickly. And and where I was extremely critical in the first few days, and publicly so of the Obama administration, I've been much more uh, much. I give them much higher grades as uh, as Julie does. Um, and I think that we we have also I think gotten away from this oxymoronic notion of leading from leading from behind. Um, to uh, to some extent, at least at least in this instance, but that's that's a, a longer topic. But for me, you know, the all right. Look, the Bush administration got caught flat-footed uh, with the uh, the invasion of uh, South Ossetia in August 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 of 2008. The critical factor was to make sure that all means were put were kind of were diplomatic, economic, sort of military security. That the message was sent to Mr. Putin that going to Tbilisi was a bridge too far, and. That didn't happen. That was good, and the, the analogy for me here is that Mr. Putin has to understand that going outside of Crimea is a bridge too far. Uh, time will tell. I have a, if I can just comment briefly, I mean, I have a, I think a slightly different view than my colleagues because I, you know, I don't think that well, the United States is not going to fight a war with Russia to try to wrest Crimea back, and I really doubt that it will fight a war with Russia, even if Russia moves into eastern Ukraine. And I think President Putin knows that. Uh, and so I don't know that, um, you know, the signaling that we would try to do is particularly credible. Um, we should, I think we should be doing some things through NATO to reassure our allies. Um, but, you know, if we send ships into the Black Sea, you know, is it sending a signal that they're there because they'll shoot at Russian troops that are based in Ukraine and Putin will be scared of that and then we'll think twice about moving on eastern Ukraine because that would precipitate a war between the United States and Russia, or the United States and NATO, or, uh, Russia and NATO. I just don't think that that's particularly credible. You don't think that he would, well, okay. Uh, John? We disagree. Thank you very much, oh, uh, John, John O'Sullivan, the Danube Institute. Um, you, you are, uh, for the last 10 years, 15 really, we've had strategists on both sides of the Atlantic talking about diverging political cultures, with the Europeans being law-governed Kantians and the Americans being 
Hobbesian um, followers of Mars. <laughs> and yet whenever, uh, in the most recent occasions in Georgia and um, the beginnings of this crisis, um, it's the Europeans uh, who have been least concerned, it seemed, less concerned rather, about the breaches of international law and the conventions that have underpinned the peace in recent years, and the Americans who've been stronger on this. Um, I was very encouraged by the opening remarks of all the speakers, because you seem to be saying um, that the, the both sides of the Atlantic were in a sense moving towards each other in, in, the, in the movement towards a a stronger and more united and really somewhat tougher response than initially seemed to be the case. Well, first of all, do you think that that is going to continue? Insofar as political cultures have diverged, is there some long-term actions we can take to bring them together? And finally, does Central Europe, uh, is, is Central Europe different in this respect? And if it is, and if, it's, if it is closer to the Americans' view, and I think it is, um, how can we encourage that, and what use can we make of it in intra-alliance councils? So, I, I mean, I think there, it's, it, this is an interesting time for the transatlantic relationship um, in terms of how they look at their toolkit, how they look at grand strategy. And in many ways, they're facing a lot of the same challenges back at home. So you've got two sides of the Atlantic uh, that feel incredibly constrained by the era of austerity, right? So we've got just blanket resource constraints. We don't necessarily feel like we can do as much as we used to be able to do. And in Europe, in particular, on the defense side, this plays out in a much more dramatic way with declining defense budgets, but we've seen it here too, but also cuts to development assistance just across the board. So that, that's factor number one. Factor number two is we now see polling data on both sides of the Atlantic where we've got publics that are war weary, they're exhausted, um, questions about the utility of military force, questions about post-conflict reconstruction, our ability to rebuild a country like Afghanistan kind of limping away from Afghanistan slash Iraq, drawing different sets of lessons. In some cases, we see instances where folks are leaning quite dramatically towards retrenchment. And then you pair that with huge domestic priorities, a huge list of domestic priorities that distract us, that draw our attention, that keeps our finance ministers focused on those domestic priorities versus foreign policy priorities. We've got elections. Um, the EU is going to be facing some changes in leadership. NATO is going to be having a new secretary general. I mean, it's a very transformative landscape for both sides of the Atlantic. And so they're both facing some kind of broad existential questions about kind of the role of US European leadership, the, where does the liberal order sit as we see rising powers, you know, either rise and then fall or rise a little bit and not as much as we expected, but broad questions about our ability to promote um, democracy and human rights overseas. And so there are just deep existential questions that I think has led us both down a path where we're just a little bit more hesitant and gun shy on any international issue. And we've seen this play out just across multiple regions. Uh, and so I think in the case of Ukraine, you've, you're seeing it play out as well. I mean, I've had I've interesting conversations with Europeans in the last two weeks where some have said, look, we're kind of with you. We want to have something with teeth, but this is a really tough time for us. We have national elections coming up. If we go too far in supporting the Ukrainian government or too far with sanctions, that's going to hurt us. We're going to have these far right or whatever they're worried about, some extreme party coming in. And so there's just this deep anxiety that's kind of casting the shadow over the dialogue. So while I think that we've done all right in coming together over the last two weeks, I do, to your point about what comes next, I do worry about divisions that will resurface because the choices will get harder. So one thing, for example, we could look at, and this is where you're going to see considerable friction, is do we look at the question of military sales to Russia? Uh, you do have um, uh, French uh, delivery of uh, an LHD uh, scheduled for next year. So do we want to have a conversation about that, about whether or not the Mistral should show up uh, in Russian hands? Uh, you know, obviously the French perspective right now is too soon to have that conversation, but we may get there, right? And then as we get through the low-hanging fruit on sanctions, targeted sanctions are one thing. 
But I, I guarantee you, and I know for a fact that the administration here in Washington is much more eager to take that to the next level. With blanket sanctions, it doesn't necessarily be, will be a list of 20, but they really want to take it to the next level. When will Europe be prepared to do that and to what degree? Um, we've heard some encouraging signals, but I think it could get, it could get complicated. And then as I noted at the NATO summit, there's going to be a lot of friction there. Central and Eastern Europe, I mean, our partners in that corner of Europe are very keen to see innovation, initiative on the partnership front. I think a lot of Washington agrees with that. It's clear Western Europe does not. Uh, and we could be leading up to a summit where there will be not so helpful public debates about this, again, that show that wedge between Central and Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and Washington. Uh, that Putin just relishes it. I mean, he loves to see stuff like that. And the more in disarray we appear, the better it is for him. So, um, so to your question about kind of what we're in for in the weeks and months ahead, assuming this continues to spiral out of control, or even if we just stay in status quo, I think the potential for transatlantic disagreement is pretty great. We've learned some lessons. I think we're getting a little bit smarter about how we handle this. But I do see uh, trouble on the horizon. OK. Uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. Andrew, you mentioned that um, uh, Crimea depends entirely on drinking water and uh, um, Oh, and electricity on, on, on Ukraine. I don't okay. know how far the sources of this go back in Ukraine, but um, aren't you afraid that maybe Putin can use yes. a new pretext to go into this area by <laughs> saying that someone wants to cut off, even though the Ukrainians have said that they will not? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Quick one. <laughs> now, we've already had some Central Asian countries threaten wa war over water access, so yeah. Uh, uh, yes, it, it, can, it can cut both ways. Okay. I think we have some questions. Do you want to? I'm, excuse me? The, 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 dan the danger that Russia would use a pretext uh, to do something similar. Uh, beyond the borders of Crimea, to me, has been a real danger on burning a hole in the front lobe of my brain. <laughs> yes. And there are, you know, we could spend, you know, kind of two hours or more kind of going, in, going, going into it, but uh, ab ab absolutely. Um, and we have to understand, because there has been a consistent, consistent, now 14 years of underestimating the Mr. Putin, both on the domestic political front and on the international oh. front. Uh, and for him, this is this is a vital interest as he as he sees it and you know and as the majority of the russian people see it see it as well not necessarily the reconstitution of the soviet union but let's go back to 1990 and think about the extremely popular uh short book that alexander solzhenitsyn wrote about the vision of a Kind of Eurasian Union that would include essentially Ukraine, Belarus, Northern Kazakhstan, and and the Russian the Russian Federation. So you know, he is focused on this like a laser beam, um, and he has obviously displayed the capacity to think you know two or three steps ahead of ahead of us, um, and I don't know whether and how he can actually be detoured. But I do know that, a, as uh, Richard put it, that a military conflict uh, in Ukraine, it's not going to be a five-day war. Right? And the repercussions from that are going to be huge. 
and they're going to be long lasting and some of them are probably unimaginable I think as we as we sit here today okay. I have some questions in the back so you keep your hand up uh, Paul Kaminar with the American uh, Hungarian Federation um, when this crisis started to unfold President Obama addressed the nation and said that any military intervention in Ukraine by Russia uh, would not be in the interest of Ukraine, Russia, or Europe. And notably absent from those carefully prepared remarks is any interest of the United States, uh, let alone making any reference to the Budapest memo and Article 5 and so forth. And then his recent meeting with the Prime Minister, he talked about the right of self-determination, um, which lead, may lead some Russian sympathizers to say, well, Crimea used to be part of Russia, and we're now having a referendum to determine our self-determination. So my qu question is, is the administration doing a good enough job of articulating our interest to the American people? I, I'll start, and then, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, if you're advising, uh, you know, Julie and I both worked uh, on the NSC staff, and if, and, and if you're advising a, a president, um, you, what you don't like to see is the president go out there and basically to the world publicly announce a red line or a red light and then see that red light gone through in less than 24 hours, right? Okay, so, yeah. so if they could get that one back, my guess is they probably would do that one a little bit differently. Um, you know, that's why I said before, I think the, the first task here is to lay out what precisely the American objectives are or the American interests here and why they're bigger than, um, than, than just Crimea, they're bigger than just Ukraine, they're bigger even than just Europe. We have to, I think the administration has to kind of walk the line between, um, you know, talking about the sort of international law and norms aspects without getting too legalistic about this because there, there's some danger that this becomes kind of a legal exercise, and the Russians say, well, okay, but Kosovo, you didn't have a UN Security Council resolution, didn't stop you from going to war, and, you know, so, we, you know, when international law is on your side, you want to use it, when it's on our side, we'll use it. Um, you know, so th there's a balance to be had here, but this needs to be articulated, I think, in, in, in both local, regional, and international terms in the language of interests as well as legality. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's also complicated by the fact that Putin, I mean, Putin's so slippery and is going to argue this, you know, 50 times backwards and forwards. But, you know, he, he's also talking about, well, you know, Yanukovych gets up and says, I'm in charge. I'm still in power. I am dictating the following. In I'm putting in the, yeah, in this, yeah, not standing in Kiev. But, you know, Putin has this connective tissue to Yanukovych and they'll play it out as, well, this isn't an infringement on, of, Crimea's territorial sovereignty, uh, as the administration has noted, but in fact, this is a humanitarian mission at the request of someone I see to be still in power. So, I mean, I think Richard's right. It's like, it's it's hard to write this um, for a broad audience and in a few minutes, you know, go through the legal ease of it and explain the history of it and then outline uh, U.S. interests. And I mean, I, I think the president has been out quite a bit. I, I know um, they're they're trying to see what they could do um, to get you know as much joint international engagement on this. I mean, I'd like to see some joint transatlantic statements, more Europeans and Americans standing shoulder to shoulder, um, and there'll be opportunities to do that obviously on the president's upcoming trip. But um, I I want to see more messaging done from Europe and the United States, because I think it's much more powerful in, when we stand together. Okay. Uh, just a quick, quick, quick comment, because it kind of combines uh, answers sure. to, to both questions, uh, or your earlier question. Because, I mean, it, and it gets back to Julie's first point, I think, that, I mean, we have been kind of operating under the assumption that European security has been more or less resolved. And to suddenly have it put in our right smack dab in our face in this way is, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to deal with. Uh, and uh, I've never been inside the government, but I can only have sympathy for people, you know, who are working, you know, 18, 20 hour days probably, you know, on the phones and watching every piece of information to try to coordinate everything. Um, having said that, 
uh, I think that uh, it, and this is, uh, Richard talked about this some, and I think Julie too, you know, sometimes less is more, uh, actually, you know, less talk from the president out front and maybe more quieter uh, engagement through through channels. We know that is that is going. And it's interesting to see, for example, you know, how we're trying to work with those that are that are have some contact or different kind of relationship with Mr. Putin, whether it is uh, uh, Kazakh, Kazakhstan, uh, who Mr. Nazarbayev was in Moscow and met with Mr. Putin and Lukashenko in a customs union meeting last last Monday. And there was a a statement from an official statement from Kazakhstan that emphasized the inviolability of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. That's Im that's Im that's important. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, China is the big Kahuna uh, in this, and where kind of where 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 they where they go, and they walk uh, they're walking a very 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 thin thin line. Um, it is going to be interesting to see you know how the opportunity is used in less than two weeks when. Uh, uh, for the nuclear security meeting in The Hague, where Mr. Obama is scheduled to be. If Mr. Putin is supposed to be there. The chances that he shows up, uh, slim to none, I would think. Uh, so probably Mr. Medvedev or Mr. Mr. Lavrov. But uh, Mr. Nazarbayev will be there. Other leaders will be there. That's an, an opportunity also to, uh, to have those kinds of, kinds of uh, uh, con conversation. Um, but it's, it, I think it's hard for us to kind of come up with these sort of doctrinal uh, you know, view of uh, well, this is what this is how we're this is this is the the new new thing for European security when we're still we're in the thick of the crisis and we we don't know how this is going to end and we're you got to be spending ninety nine percent of your time simply trying to put the fire out with every uh, tool tool possible. Uh, of course, we've run to this problem before of our anticipating a peace in Europe only to be shattered. I mean, hundred years ago. World War One, even closer. I remember in 1990, early 1990s, the Cold War was over. We thought we were home free. Our wars broke out in former uh, Yugoslavia. Then there was Georgia, which came out of nowhere. We thought those conflicts were frozen, and then we realized how they can be unfrozen quickly. So the, so it's that image of the, the, the fog of so war. What we want, we want your well, peace, but, but we're kind of in a we're kind of in a fog right now. Uh, uh, that's the scary thing. Okay, the gentleman has his hand in the back, please. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court World Docs. Uh, as the Crimea was under Russian rule for 200 years before it was turned over or joined with the Ukraine uh, just 60 years ago, and not through the wishes of the people of the Crimea, but uh, uh, through a high-level agreement, uh, why shouldn't we look on the return of Crimea, uh, the Crimea to Russian sovereignty as the resolution of an anomaly? That would have been a lot easier to do before a military occupation than a call for an election while while Crimea is being occupied militarily by Russian military forces. That's kind of what goes, it goes back to my, 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 my first comment that uh, you know, Mr. Putin has taken things to the point where he makes choices for us extremely limited. Uh, this, you know, he, I think that one could one could easily imagine a path where that could have could have happened, you know, over the over a period of several months after you have elections in, in Kiev with it with it with a with a different government and where there are negotiations all along the way. Uh, but this is just put it in a much more complicated context. Probably my Well and you know, President Putin has become the champion of self determination of you know, minorities <laughs> in other countries. So I'm waiting Except for the, the Chechen uh, res, uh, yeah. referendum for secession from Russia exactly. and how the Russians, uh, how he would respond to that or, or Ingushetia yeah. or, or any of these other uh, regions. So yeah. I'm still in kind of the waiting pattern for that. Any more, any last question? If not, please.